Well, hello! Well, I thought we'd have a little change of scenery today. Rather than the usual disastrous modeling workbench behind me, I thought I'd have the slightly less disastrous kit collection, or at least part of it anyway. So, today I'm filming from the vast underground storehouse where I keep my models. Actually, it's a small room in the basement, but eh, close enough. Right, and you may notice that I am wearing yet more work plastic paraphernalia. Merchandise, not merch. Merchandise. Say it properly. So, here we go. This is actually a pre production prototype. I've since changed the artwork, so it's a uh, picture's a little bit bigger now. But uh, you remember this crazy coot from the first video? Darn smirt he is. Oh, yeah. Well, you too can now have him in t shirt form or on a mug, sticker, baseball jersey, sweatshirt, whatever you like. Check him out. Be the smartest person in your neighborhood. Now, let's carry on then, shall we? 135th versus 132nd. That can of worms. Now, I'm sure there's quite a few videos on this subject out there. Personally, I've only seen one, and if I recall, that fellow was, if not in favor, at least, well, he didn't seem to have a problem with the concept. Um, I've seen a few comments on modeling forums, or a forum. I'm not in the habit of frequenting modeling forums. I rarely, if ever, visit them. But I was looking for something else entirely, and I happened to come across a thread that uh, discussed this subject. So I thought, oh, what the hell? I'll check it out. Let's see what other people think about this. A couple of them were in favor. One or two didn't really seem to care. Uh, and several were... Mm, rather adamantly against the idea. So I thought I'd throw my two cents worth in the ring. And after YouTube pays me a fraction of a percentage and the government takes their cut, it literally is two cents worth. So for what it's worth, what it's worth, here we go. Now, scale. Well, in the early days of modeling in its infancy, maybe pre-Cambrian era of modeling, shall we say, Scale wasn't really an issue. Uh, kit companies like Limbered Line, Aurora, Comet, ITC, Revell, etc. had a standard range of box sizes, and they designed and tooled kits to fit in those boxes. Rather a bizarre concept to us today, especially given the fact that it probably doesn't cost very much to tool up a box, but it costs a hell of a lot to tool up a model kit. Heyo, that was the deal then. The demographic was different. I think kits were uh, aimed at kids and maybe younger teenagers kind of thing back then. And uh, the standards were lower, as I say. It was a hobby that was in its infancy, so they were still testing the waters. Now, so we had bizarre scales back then, like 1 to 41 or 1 to 88. 1 to 81, that kind of thing, and all sorts of other weird scales, 1 one twenty eighth, one ninety sixth, one sixtieth, bizarre things like that. It wasn't really an issue. And then, at some point, and I certainly don't pretend to know the minutiae of what went on, I don't know the detailed history of plastic modeling, by any means I have a, a vague layman's knowledge at best. but. At some point, for whatever reason, constant scale kits started to come out. Now, in Asian countries and probably Eastern Europe countries that were metric based, the earliest scales were based on the metric system, which is simple. So we had scales like 150th, 170th, 175th, 1100. For us here in the imperialist capitalist West that used the imperial system, you guessed it, we used scales that were based on the imperial system. So we had 172nd scale, which is 1 inch equals 6 feet on the model. We had 148th, or as it used to be known, quarter inch scale, because a quarter of an inch equaled 1 foot on the model. And 32nd scale, 3 eighths inch equals a foot, etc, etc, etc. So, at some point, and for reasons I have no idea what they are. The metric-based scales seem to disappear. 
and our imperialistic scales took over. So we became entrenched in the scales we know and love today, like 172nd, 148th, 132nd, and on the fringes, 124th and 1144th. Now, of course, there are other bizarre scales in there, like Trumpeter has some 118th scale aircraft kits and other weird little things, but for the most part, and for sake of simplicity, we had five major scales. However, there was one holdout of the metric era. For some reason, it took off and it stayed and it's with us today. And that's 135th. And that became the armor scale. All the other ones, mostly aircraft. But 135th was and is for armor. We all accepted that. We went with it. We built up our collections. We were happy. Times were good. Children laughed. Birds sang. We had our scales. We had our collections and our favorite scales and subjects. Life was good. And then there was a disturbance in the force. I don't know when that happened. Late 20th century, maybe? We started to see helicopters in 135th scale. Well, hang on. 135th, that's for tanks and things, isn't it? Apparently not. Now, I thought at the time, eh, it's a fad. Because, let's face it, you know, in the early days, um, the likes of Monogram and Airfix tried to come out with 132nd scale armor, and that kind of fizzled out and died, so... I thought the same thing would happen with 135th scale helicopters. Now, I understood the logic of this, because many land forces do have helicopters in their inventory. So if you wanted to model, say, a complete collection of U.S. Army or Royal Army military equipment, then, yeah, sure, you'd have AFVs, soft skins, and helicopters. It makes sense. I don't like it. But it makes sense. I understand it. So, it took off and it stayed with us until today. Now, me personally, I, it doesn't matter what branch of the service something serves in. To me, it's what it is or what it does. And a helicopter is an aircraft. It's a craft that flies through the air. Ergo, it's an aircraft. So, I personally would have preferred to have seen them in 132nd scale because that fits in my aircraft collection. It makes sense. I have a vast number of helicopters in 172nd scale. Nothing back here, I don't think. Uh, well, there is a World War I helicopter up here somewhere. That PKZ thing. Anyway, I do have a lot of 172nd scale helicopters in my aircraft collection because to me, they are aircraft. They belong in the aircraft collection, not in the armor collection. They're not tanks. Sure, they're used by the army, but they're still aircraft. My personal feelings on the subject, that's just the way it is. I'm a little disappointed by it because there's a lot of really nice helicopter kits that I would have jumped on. For instance, this one. Would have loved to have that. Absolutely, I love the Sikorsky Sky Crane. It's an amazing looking machine. It's powerful, it's versatile, and it's just completely bizarre looking, isn't it? Plus, as a young kid, I was very fortunate to see one in action when it came into uh, the airport in Chilliwack, BC, where I grew up. Well, not at the airport, obviously, but I, I grew up in the town of Chilliwack. Um, and one dropped in for fuel, and I was fortunate enough to see it. And in fact, there is a picture of said machine at Chilliwack Airport. So, I would have loved to have had a 132nd scale Sikorsky Sky Crane. But alas, it was not to be because ICM, in their infinite wisdom, decided to release it in 135th scale. It looks gorgeous, and I am a big fan of ICM. Their kits are fantastic. But I'm afraid I'm not going to shell out that much money for a helicopter that doesn't fit in my aircraft collection. Now, I have to admit that I don't have a lot of helicopters in 132nd scale, and part of the reason for that is it seems that you can't really get that many because they're all in 135th. Hey, but if I wanted to build up a collection of, say, 
Vietnam era helicopters. Well, I could do this. That's in 132nd scale. Which leads me to another point is that ICM can't really decide what scale they want helicopters to be in because they also produce this in 135th. But this one is 132nd. So if I wanted my Vietnam War helicopter collection, I could have this. And I could have this. But alas, sadly, unfortunately, oh dear, I couldn't add the Sikorsky Skyframe because it's the wrong scale. Now, maybe I'm just being too persnickety. Maybe I'm a little too pedantic with this scale thing. But there is an 8% difference between 132nd and 135th. Actually, if you want to be pedantic, it's 8.59 or something like that. It's about 8.5% which is a pretty fair whack, I think, you know, in this day and age when people get bent out of shape when their 172nd scale aircraft is a scale foot over length, or over width, or span, whatever, to have an 8.5% difference is pretty major. Now, from what I could find out, the sky crane is 70 feet 3 inches long in real life. In 135th scale, that works out to 24 inches. In 132nd, that works out to about 26 and a half inches. So we're talking a two and a half inch difference. It's pretty major. Though so sure, if I wasn't so pedantic and uptight about this kind of thing, I could bunk that sky crane next to my other two helicopters and go, well, there you go, you know. But in actuality, you don't really because this big helicopter should be just a little bit longer in order to make it proportional. And that's one of the things that I love about constant scale. You see, it gives me an instant visual representation of how big things are compared to each other. Now, on those nights when I occasionally can't sleep and my mind is wandering to all sorts of bizarre subjects and I'm laying there and thinking, I wonder how big a Fokker triplane is compared to a Douglas Skyray. I could go to a airport at random every day, all day, for the rest of my life in the hopes that one day a Fokker triplane and a Douglas Skyray will turn up and park next to each other and then I'd have the answer to my question. But I think that's unlikely. However, I have the answer right in the comfort of my own home. A Fokker triplane and a Douglas Skyray. Now I know. Or that other question that's plagued mankind for generations. Is an Airbus Beluga really that big? Well, yeah, actually, check this out compared to a Tomcat, which in itself is no slouch size-wise. Yeah, the Beluga is pretty freaking big. So, that's one of the reasons I like constant scale. Me personally, again, you know, just my thing. I know I'm a little uptight. But, I have to assume that companies that are producing these 135th scale helicopter kits must have done market research. I haven't, I must admit that. I don't really have that opportunity. However, with this video, maybe I do. We'll get to that. So, I'm not privy to the results of their market research. I have to assume they've done some, because let's face it, Tooling up a model kit is a huge financial investment. Not something I would imagine they take lightly. You know, sitting around a board meeting go, what should we produce for a kit next? Oh, I know, a sky crane. <laughs> Done. Do it. No, they're not going to do that. They can ask people. They're going to want to know, is this thing going to sell? And so I have to assume that their research convinced them they were going to sell more helicopters to armor modelers than they would to aircraft modelers. I can't see it, but that's just me. I don't know. So that's helicopters. I understand the logic behind it. I don't like it. I'm disappointed by it. I'm not going to buy helicopters in that scale, but I can't do much about it. Which brings me to 135th scale aircraft.
in particular, this one. What the hell? So I'm perusing the future releases section of the Hannant's website one day. As I do, you know, because we all want to know what the next big kid is that's coming out, don't we? We're not satisfied with what we've already got. Who oh, no, got to have more. Anyway, so something catches my eye on there. A large-scale cape. Hmm, this piques my interest. I'm a big fan of World War II Japanese aviation. I already have a Tamiya Zero in 132nd scale, so this would look pretty cool sitting next to it. But hang on. And it has it listed as 135th scale. Surely this cannot be right. I mean, it's not unlike Hannon's to make mistakes when they list things, and they've done that with my very own Thunderbird Models products. And by the way, if uh, you're looking for a set of masks for the Eshi or Italeri Falker Friendship, they are in fact 72nd scale, not 1144th, as Hannon's has them listed. But I digress. 135th scale, a cape, a Japanese carrier-borne naval aircraft in the armor scale. It's crazy talk. This cannot be correct. It must be wrong. It's a mistake. So I had a closer look at the box art, and sure enough, there it is, in big numbers, 135. And uh, uh, what? I'm sorry. This makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. This was designed as a carrier-borne, as I said, aircraft um, designed to drop torpedoes and bombs from level flight. The only way it would come within a hundred miles of a tank is if it was dropping bombs on one or launching a torpedo at a ship that was carrying them. Sure, it did operate from land-based airfields later, but again, what are the chances of a Type 97 Chiha medium tank trundling across the field and parking itself next to a gate? Well, I don't know, but I'm willing to wager slim to none. So, yeah, I don't get it. This, this is just a bizarre choice to me. Now, the only place I've seen any attempt at an explanation for this was on a forum where I happened to catch eye of the thread talking about this subject. And someone offered the uh, explanation that Border Models wanted to do this so it would fall in line with their 135th scale armor models, which is what they're known for, and I believe they started out doing them. But again, this makes no sense to me. Tamiya has had an extensive range of 135th scale armor for decades, but their large-scale aircraft kits are all 132nd, and that was fine for us. It worked for us. So, yeah. I don't know. And... It's not limited to the Kate, of course. Uh, it's the inevitable Luftwaffe type, which doesn't really interest me too much, but I know a lot of people are into that. But, you know, we've got some really nice-looking kits coming out in 135th scale. And even our beloved Spitfire is not immune. It's just not right, I tell you. Now, I do have a fair collection of 135th scale armor. I haven't built any since I was a kid, but I do intend to. And I'm perfectly fine to keep them as a separate entity from my aircraft model. I don't see the need to mix them. You know, 135th armor over here, 132nd aircraft over there. That works for me. I'm fine with that. Of course, we could have saved ourselves all this trouble if long ago somebody had actually made up their damn minds about a scale. You know, monogram and airfix, as I said tried to come out with 132nd scale tanks, but that didn't really work, apparently. So, if long ago we had made up our minds and gone, well, let's make the large scale 135th, and then all aircraft and armor would be 135th. That would have been fine. Or, 132nd, all armor and all aircraft would have been 132nd. All would have been good. Life would have been fine. Food would have been plentiful. Unlike now, when we can't afford it because it's so freaking expensive. But again, I digress. So, there we are. And of course, it's not limited to border models either. Bronco has a range of 135th scale aircraft. Although, I have to say, theirs at least make a little more sense. They have a Horsa, um, and that did you know, carry infantry and 
jeeps and things in the Battle of Normandy, so sure, okay, yeah, I can kind of go with tanks, I guess. Uh, they also do a Piper L4 and a Fiesler Storch, which were both Army liaison and spotter aircraft. So, yeah, okay, if we must, kind of makes sense, I suppose. And again, I have to assume that they've done market research on this. But I cannot, for the life of me, think how this research convinced them that more armor modelers were going to build a Cape torpedo bomber than aircraft modelers. I mean, who's taking part in this research? Who did they poll? Good afternoon, madam. My name is Andy, and I'm the director of research for Warp Plastic. How are you this fine afternoon? Well, I'm super, fantastic, excellent. I'm conducting market research on behalf of Thunderbird Models, and I wonder if you could spare a few minutes of your valuable time. Well, I... Marvelous! Super! Great! Now, you are a plastic model aficionado specializing in miniature replicas of armored fighting vehicles to a scale of 135. Is this correct? Well, no, I don't. Fantastic! Superlative! Marvelous! Now, Thunderbird Models is planning an exciting new range of 135 scale airliners, commencing with the Boeing 747. Is this something that you, madam, as a purveyor of 135 scale model kits, would be interested in purchasing? Oh, well, I don't. Excellent, fabulous, superfluous. Thank you so much for your time, and a very good day to you, madam. Hey, my. Whatever the fuck was that all about? So, I'm trying. I really am, but uh, I'm afraid I just can't get my head around this. I just don't understand it. I don't like it. No, sir, I don't get it. I don't understand this business model. No pun intended. I mean, wouldn't you think a business would want to maximize its profits by selling model aircraft to people that actually build model aircraft instead of people that don't really? Is that crazy? I thought that was the idea of running a company was to try and get as much money out of it as you can, especially if you've made a huge initial investment to get your product out there. Seems reasonable to me. I mean, Border Models had an ideal opportunity here to complete the trilogy of World War II single-engine Japanese naval aircraft in 132nd scale. Got a nice Tamiya Zero, got that Infinity Models Val, and then we've got... Oh, no, wait, we didn't get the capes. The armored crowd got the cape. What? Hey-ho. But, as I say... The likes of you and I, I'm afraid most of us won't be privy to the results of their market research, so we don't know what they're thinking, really. So, why don't we run our own little informal market research right here? I'd love to know what you fine folks think about this. You know how I feel, but if you could leave a comment or two and let me know, are you yay, nay, or eh, whatever? That would be great. I'd really appreciate that, because I'm damn curious. Am I the only old curmudgeon that feels this way, or does anybody else out there think it's... I don't know. So let me know. Is it a good thing? A real boon to the hobby? Or is it the stupidest idea since Fruit of the Loom came out with a line of stainless steel underpants? Or do you not give a tiny rat's furry butt one way or the other? Do let me know. I'll do my best to collate the results, and we'll see what we come up with, and I'll let you know in the next video. I'll leave this to run for a week or so, and uh, hopefully we'll get quite a few comments, and we'll get a good cross-section, and uh, yeah, tabulate the results, and got our own market research. Excellent. So, that's going to do it for today. Um, thank you again for watching, as always. I really do appreciate it. You know what you gotta do now? Like, subscribe, join, share, comment, do comment. Comments are good. And buy stuff. Stuff a turkey, smell of roses, all that stuff. So until the next video, um, and I will hopefully, all going well, I'll have the results of this survey for you. And there'll be an update on the Hasegawa P12E that I've been building. And that's gonna do it. Thank you and bye-bye.